All right. So, um, just to say that we haven't covered varicose veins in this section. So, what we did this year with boot camp is the feedback we got was more time up in the lab, less time listening to you know, people like me talking to you. And so, there are probably twice as many lectures last year as you've got. They are all up on the the Dicet YouTube website that you can kind of look at. They're in video format. They're not really, that's why. I, uh, I was hesitating about uh, the, being able to give you the slides. The videos will all be there, but we have to figure out how we actually put the slides up there if you if you want to download those. So um, up in the lab this afternoon, just to orient you, there's going to be same kind of format as there was yesterday. There'll be cadavers where you're going to do more peripheral exposures, um, and then the models where you actually get to do the anastomoses, and then you know where you were on the end of ask the towers yesterday. It's going to, there's going to be Ivis there filter placement, filter retrieval. So that's kind of what the rotations are going to be like. Okay, so diagnosis and management of arterial venous malformations. I would say this is like MEN1 syndrome for vascular surgeons. They ain't being cured and they're coming back. And so this is a patient of mine who's got Klippel-Trenoni syndrome. Basically, you get kind of these venous malformations and agenesis of the femoral vein. And this is a real problem. I've been seeing him for 10 years, and he's now got, starting to get foot drop because he's got venous aneurysms, which are sitting on top of his sciatic nerve. I actually did send him up to see um, Peter Glavitsky at Mayo Clinic, and we really don't have a, have, a, have a good solution for this. And so there's a combination that you can see the kind of port wine stains, but his entire leg basically has this venous malformation. And so these things vary from being completely trivial uh, with no intervention, the kind of incidental finding to be, you know, limb threatening and potentially life threatening. And on the on the other side, you can actually see, you know, an arterial venous malformation uh, and down in the patient's pelvis. And so the broad categorization of this is that you really, what there's all sorts of classification. I can't really stand these ideologic things because I don't really understand them. But what matters to you when they roll through the door is what I need to know in order to treat the patient. And so. It broadly breaks down into there are lymphatic malformations. You'll see very few of those. And then there's venous malformations and arterial venous malformations and a whole mix really between the two. And, and that's really what's going to drive therapy. If it's arterial venous, it's primarily going to be some form of embolotherapy. If it's venous, then it's going to be ablative. In other words, you can do it with sodium tetrodecal sulfate, you can do it basically with, with alcohol. Um, and you're, uh, so those, uh, that's the broad category of how you're going to do this. Often you can tell this pretty well clinically. Usually it is MR or CT scan that's going to give you the, the diagnosis. And then you'll hear people talk about if it's an arterial venous malformation, defining the feeding vessels and the nidus. I still don't understand what the nidus is. I think the nidus is as far out as you can get before the T arteries end and then it goes into the venous side. And what that means practically for you is that you really need to do super selective catheterization. If you want, and, and some of the people that we work with around this are neuroradiologists. I mean, they're doing these things inside your head. They have wires and skills that you can learn from. And of all the other specialties that I work with, I work very closely with one of our neuroradiologists and I always learn something from him. For example, we were talking about carotid body tumors the other day and said, you don't biopsy the carotid body. We had this huge thing, which is essentially a TNV and small formation of the carotid. And for one reason or other, we couldn't embolize it from the arterial side because it was shunting through into the posterior circulation. And this guy said, well, let's just stick it directly. And went, no, 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 that's not what you do in the vascular surgery. Yeah, I said, yeah, a whole bunch published. And so next thing he takes his big needles out, starts jamming it into the patient's neck. And each time you did it and he aspirated, you were endovascular. And we did this beautiful embolization using onyx. That's heresy in our world. It's why you want to work with other people and, and listen to them. So bottom line is, if you've got a TDV and a small formation, you understand, need to understand what the feeding arteries are. You need to understand basically how far out you can get because you want to get to these small, uh, smaller vessels. And you need to know what the outflow patterns are. And these patterns change. As you start taking out part of that circulation, things start moving around. So you've got to reevaluate this continuously because non-target organ embolization is one of the things that you really want to avoid. So most of these present either with local pain. Now that, is, that malformation has been there for a long time and suddenly it starts hurting. That's often because they develop venous thromboses inside the malformation. And so they'll tell you, suddenly started hurting, there's all these lumps that I can feel in it now. That's because there's little areas of thrombus what's in it. And if that's all that bothers them, you can usually manage them through this. On the other hand, these things can be 
um, just happened to be next to like the patient I showed you, right next to the sciatic nerve, and that is a limb-threatening problem that he's got. Clearly, if you're inside the head, it, it, can, be, it can be a major problem. Heart failure is often mentioned when you talk about that. I think I've seen that once. And you're not talking about something that's even that size and the one here. I mean, you're talking about something that is absolutely enormous with arteries this big and veins this big that are coming out of it. And so heart failure is pretty uncommon. I mean, let's think, you put arterial venous shunts in patients all the time who've got heart disease and they don't usually get heart failure associated with it. But some of these patients have pain. It can cause neuromuscular dysfunction. It can cause significant deformity and that is an issue all on its own. You can get ulceration, and when you start getting ulceration, you've got to do something about it because you're going to be dealing with some bleeding problems. So you can think of the ones for absolute indications. These are the ones that are kind of listed up here. The relative indications, you know, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to actually take these things on. And we'll start talking about how to do this. So conservative treatment, it's just a venous malformation. It's like big giant varicose veins in your legs, stockings, limb elevation. It's often, so what I tell the patient is, I'm not going to cure this, okay? This is, you can live with this for the rest of your life. There's, and they're worried about how big it's going to get. Now, that's unpredictable. But there are certain things that tend to cause acceleration. Pregnancy is one of the things you worry about. Um, being on the pill sometimes is associated with enlargement of these. Trauma has been described as being associated with them. So... The, the young patients are worried about what is going to happen long term. And I don't think that, that, that you can actually predict what's going to happen with these patients. If you can cut it out, we cut it out. So if it's some local thing, we're going to take it out. That's the one group of patients that you're actually going to cure. Um, sometimes we do preoperative embolization, sometimes we don't. What you don't want to do on the principles is ligate the major feeding vessel. So we had a patient that we saw you know, recently who came in, had a big pelvic malformation, and guess what the, the, one of the brilliant surgeons did? They ligated the internal iliac artery. The good news was they weren't even very good at that because they didn't manage to actually completely occlude the artery. So there's a little channel coming down to the middle. We get a wire through it and we blow their, their surgical suture apart so we can get way down basically into their pelvis in order to be able to treat it. But again, you don't want to start, you want to get the catheters out as far as you can get it. And so it starts off with doing just a general arteriogram so you understand where these vessels are coming from. So for example, a pelvic malformation may be feeding off the internal iliac. You may see huge branches coming up through the cruciate and astomosis. You may find they're coming from the contralateral internal iliac. You need to map that out beforehand. And the reason for that is you're going to start, as you start embolizing it, you, you need to know what those patterns are because you'll start seeing particles and onyx going in places that you don't particularly want it to go to. So, so map out the flow patterns basically into the uh, arteriovenous malformation. You need a stable position for doing the embolization. One of the problems with, with doing embolization, the catheters get blocked up. So you want a sheath positioned close to the target so that if the catheter gets blocked up with the stuff that you're putting in there, then you can change the catheter out and you don't have to go through the entire navigation pathway in order to be able to get there. Now, so let's go through the things that are available out there for embolization. PVE particles, by and large, are not going to be used for this. This is a lot of these things were out there. We used that, for example, if we were embolizing a renal, big renal tumor before the urologist was going to go in and take it out. The flow directed, this concept of flow directed particles carries it out in the small blood vessels and takes out the microcirculation before you take out the big vessels. Almost all of this, whether it's ethanol or um, the, the glues, the cyanoacrylates, in our practice, have almost completely been replaced by the use of onyx. Onyx is very safe. The only problem is that you, you, it's only approved for neuroradiology uses, and sometimes they won't even ship it into you unless there's a neuroradiologist involved. Not going to go through that, not going to go through this, I've kind of giving you this idea. So, what you want to know about these malformations is where are they, um, what is the location, and what is the proximity to really important structures that are in there. Sciatic nerve, I mentioned, could be the rectum. It could be basically inside the psoas muscle around, for example, the entire lumbar plexus that's going in there. Now, and so you worry as you start embolizing these things about damaging these adjacent structures. Having said all that, and this is a T2 MR showing a big venous malformation in the patient's thigh. Venous malformation, 
we use MR or CT to determine what are the various components of this arch ladder. If there is not a major arterial component, then we'll stick this thing directly under either ultrasound guidance or CT fusion uh, to take it out. And here's a patient where we opted to just to go ahead and excise this. You can see the rectus femoris being retracted anteriorly, uh, the femoral nerve in its branches, the malformation basically was completely excised right down to the femur, and then it was closed up. This is the one situation you can actually, um, uh, you, can, you can cure these patients. Embolization. Typically what I say to patient is, in the embolization world, bad stuff happens fast, good stuff happens slowly. I would much prefer to bring that patient back three or four times rather than be overly aggressive first time and, and cause a problem. And so the coils, just to mention these coils are, we are all comfortable with them, we're safe they're really not going to get out into the nidus. You tend to use these only in a situation where we're trying to slow the flow down. So typically what you're doing as you're doing these injections is trying to see how fast the blood shunts through the malformation and comes out the other side because these particles can go through and, and even coils can sometimes go through. For example, if you look at a renal arteriovenous malformation, then there's, there are many cases where the coil is going straight through the malformation, basically out the other side, and it ends up in places that you don't want it. So Calls we use largely to slow down the flow. Microcatheters go through, and you need to be comfortable with microcatheters. And basically, then we use something like Onyx, which we're going to use uh, through, the, through the other side. So the safe steps really for embolization. As I said, good preliminary angiography. Consider all the routes. Think about collateral pathways that are opening up as you start shutting it down. And use the shortest, straightest approach, you know, especially basically when the coils tend to back things out. If you use a lot of coils, it's always the last coil you put in that causes the problem. You, know, you fill things up, fill things up. One more coil, and next thing it goes down the axial circulation. You need a stable catheter position when you're doing this. Um, and you've got to make sure these catheters are all flush. Even coils abrade the inside of the catheter and tend basically to, to block them off. Glue, we've almost stopped using to say onyx. Who's all got experience in, in using onyx? Okay, not many. You probably should, should get your hands on this. It, it is expensive, um, but it is very controlled. I mean, the whole concept is it's like lava. As you put it in, it creeps down through the blood vessels. And there are actually new balloons that are available, which uh, unlike the glues, the glues stick to everything. So you push it in and you go whip the damn catheter out. I mean, you see that up in somebody's head and the whole arterial venous malformation goes ripping around like this. It's a little alarming. The onyx doesn't stick, but it can still stick. And so now there is a called a scepter balloon that actually does not stick to the onyx and you can blow up the vessel you're in and push the onyx and it buttresses the onyx on the back end so it pushes it further and further and further uh, into the malformation. And one of the really interesting tips, because what happens is it gives you this dense radiopaque area. And again, learning this from new radiologists, you use road mapping. So when you put the onyx in, you get this big black cast that's in there. And then you go on the road map, it <coughs> subtracts out the big black cast of the onyx that's in there and lets you see where the new onyx is going. So it's a remarkably safe way, really, of, uh, of starting to do this. So the concerns are non-target distal embolization, going through the malformation and out the side. They can end up basically in the pulmonary circulation. I have no experience with alcohol. I, I, it terrifies me even reading about some of the complications. It's one of the faster ways of getting rid of uh, large venous malformations, but it can cause massive venous thrombosis. And so a guy called Wayne Yakes, basically up in, in Denver, is, is, is probably the master of this. PVA particles, I think, are largely going to be gone and no largely replaced uh, with onyx. This is, in the bottom left, is that patient I was telling you about who did this, it's a giant uh, venous malformation. Uh, arterial venous malformation in, in the pelvis, guy from Greece actually, who came back and forward multiple times basically to get this. I think we've covered, I covered a lot of this. Um, and so they're all over the place. Uh, sometimes you find them on the dorsal of the hand. Again, direct puncture of these is sometimes the safest way of getting to it. It's not any different, you know, from um, in terms of the delivery. You just take your short needle. You've got to make sure that they're onyx compatible because you, you um, flush these catheters with dimethyl sulfoxide to start with. And you've got to make sure that what you're introducing is compatible uh, with the onyx. And so, but sticking these things directly, Used to be heresy, now it's a very interesting way of actually getting into it and to deliver the agent that you're going to utilize. Sometimes they're inside the bone. We had a child from Mexico recently, and you know, he, his part of his humerus was actually replaced with the malformation. 
What do we do? We took a bone biopsy needle, screwed it straight into his humerus, injected some dye, we're inside the malformation, and delivered the onyx straight into his femur. So these are things that we would never have thought of had we not been working with other folks um, outside of our specialty. So these patients basically, I think, need a home um, because they, they're actually treated very badly. Everybody sees one or two of these patients. We have an AV malformation clinic because we're very interested in them. I think they are imaging challenging. I think they are technically challenging. They tend to go to vascular surgeons or interventional radiologists. This is a very good space to have a multidisciplinary group. We have an orthopedic surgeon, plastic surgeon sees almost all of these patients, guy from neuro IR. Uh, and one of us, basically, who's going to be involved in it. There is no single therapeutic option. You've got to brainstorm, you know, for each one of these different locations. I, as I say, we, we do a lot of image fusion here, CTMR fusion that we use really to direct the, the, to the procedure. And you're continually evol looking for a evolution or involvement of uh, vital structures. One that uh, was actually done by a new radiologist recently was a patient who had a pelvic malformation but they had a TIPS procedure on portal hypertension. And what they did was actually go from the jugular vein down through the liver, through the TIPS, basically navigated down to the pelvis on the venous side and, and embolized it from the venous side. So you get to be a little creative. You can observe them if they're not causing symptoms, you can embolize them, or if they're small enough, you know, you, you can excise them. Um, imaging, we've talked about, talked a little bit about this. I think it's an area that is ripe really for imaging research. Uh, and following these patients basically up, up long term. So uh, they need a home, and I don't think there's any group that's better than the vascular surgeons for doing that. Okay, so thank you very much.